So while Jason's coming up, I want to express my appreciation to, um, uh, to Mr. Falker and Mr. Hogue for um, uh, joining this panel, given uh, to others who couldn't make it. And it's a terrific panel. So we greatly appreciate your um, involvement. And uh, Jason Miller is probably known to all here, is the executive editor and reporter for Federal News Radio. Um, terrific reporter. He's uh, worked in the federal market for 20 years covering technology, acquisition, and management issues. Jason, delighted to have you. Thank you for being here. And I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Thanks to the folks at Billington. It's, uh, <clears throat> we're initially, as you probably saw on the, the uh, agenda, we're going to talk uh, NIST and cybersecurity. And uh, Dr. Ron Ross was supposed to be here. And we were going to have this in-depth discussion about uh, a special publication. Well, Snow ruined that. Instead, we're going to have an in-depth discussion about other things that the panel and I aren't prepared for. But we're going to have fun. And that's the most important thing. We're going we're gonna to do it from the hip a little bit. Uh, I uh, know John Felker well. Uh, he and I have had multiple conversations. Uh, I was, got the pleasure of meeting Martin today, but I saw some of his staff recently at a NIST meeting, so I got plenty to ask you. And uh, Dave, your, your uh, presentation was, gives me plenty to, to work from as, as well. So as you heard, I'm Jason Miller, Federal News Radio, federalnewsradio.com, 1500 AM. Yes, AM, I, I enjoy the AM radio button. Uh, usually now, I usually make a joke about AM radio. Uh, but instead, we're going to talk uh, cybersecurity. I'd like to start with a little bit of trivia to get us going, because I'm into audience participation, and I'm not into lectures, because I uh, sit through enough of them uh, at other conferences. So audience participation, please yell out your answer. And if you've heard my uh, 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 questions before, my apologies. Uh, uh, there's only so much trivia I can find. All right, when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, let's talk about why the state of federal cybersecurity is today. How many laws? do you think are on the books today that address cybersecurity in some way? I'm not saying like, oh, well, there's FISMA and the Cybersecurity Act of whatever, whatever, but just generally speaking, give me a guess, come on. You, no, you said nothing. Come on, yell it out, audience participation. More, less, four, too little. We're gonna tell you 60 of them, right? Relative or significant cyber provisions dating back, and this is what impressed me the most, 1878. The posse, and my Latin is not good, comitatus, do I get that right? Comitatus, see, I failed, uh, uh, is, is actually has a relevant cyber provision in there. That was not cyber back in 1878. All right, next one. The first cyber attack that impacted computers worldwide. What year? Give me a guess. This is audience participation. 85 close. Nope. 87 closer. 88. Now you get extra credit if you know what the what, what the what the attack was called. Yay! There you go. Now, if you're not familiar with the Morse worm, this is the first recognized attack of the nascent cyber infrastructure. Around 6,000 computers, largely in the U.S., were attacked. It was a weakness in the Unix system, noun one, and replicated regularly. And the gentleman who did it was Robert Morris. Who was uh, trying to gauge how big the internet was back in 1988. All right, last one. <clears throat> What law and when and what, I'm sorry, what, what law and why did Congress pass this law to make it a crime to break into computer systems? What year and what was the law? Close. 1986, I think, CFA, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, right? Yep. Now, interesting tidbit about this law, it did not prosecute juveniles. So if you were under 18 and you broke into a computer system, you weren't covered in this law. All right. So. That's how we're going to do our panel today. We're going to uh, have each of our fellow panelists Are you tell you something. We're not going to be prosecuted. Huh? You're saying we're not going to be prosecuted. No, you will be. Oh. But if you're under 18. I had a check. You had a check. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do today is is I'm going to ask each of them to tell you something you don't know, uh, except for David. He already told us stuff that he knows. So uh, I'm going to ask him a question, and then we're going to get into your questions. So please participate. Uh, remember, I'm a reporter. They'd much rather hear your questions than mine. So let me just set a little bit of context for our discussion, and then we'll get started. Uh, agencies endured 35,277 cyber incidents in fiscal 2017. That's a 14% increase over the year before. Uh, and, and five of those in 2017 reached what we call the major impact incident status. 20 agencies now report data in real time to their own CDM dashboards. In fact, I was at a hearing yesterday, and every CFO Act agency now reports to CFO 
uh, their agency dashboard, so it's actually updated since then. Um, now, as of September 29th, again, this is from the FISMA report that OMB just released, uh, DHS reports uh, 119 federal civilian agencies out of them. 31 are implementing all three phases of Einstein. That's the intrusion detection prevention system, uh, 17 of which are CFO Act agencies. So I'm setting John up to tell us all new, new data, maybe. Uh, DHS reports that between January 1, 2016 and April 28, 2017, Einstein detected 1,600 incidents across federal civilian networks using the Einstein 1 and, and 2 capabilities, and then 633 incidents using Einstein 3, uh, which is around sinkholing and email filtering. All right, so that tells you the, the, the challenges agencies face. Now things are, are getting better. We know that there's a high value asset program that is really helping agencies secure their high value assets. Uh, I, I think the goal, and Martin will tell us more about this, to, is to do 30 uh, security architecture reviews and 30 high value asset reviews uh, in 2017 and, and even more in 20, I'm sorry, 2018, and even more in 2019. Uh, a couple things that they're finding trends around uh, when they do the high value asset reviews, there's a lack of strong authentication, a lack of network segmentation, inconsistent patch management, spear phishing and gaps in security capabilities and protections remains the biggest challenges for agencies. So I know I just dumped a lot of facts and figures on you. You can find everything that I just quoted from in the FISMA report to Congress on OMB's website. So given that, let's turn to our panelists. John, I'm gonna start with you because we're unrehearsed. Uh, John works at NKIC, I don't, I'm not big on bios. Uh, NKIC is doing a lot of cool things. Tell me something I don't know. Yeah, see we're the unrehearsed. The percentage, of the, those 85,000 reported incidents. First of all, 35. I got- 35. Uh, how many? 35,000. 35,000, okay. Um, so the first thing you gotta keep in mind is how do you define incidents? Um, so the thing that you don't know is that there are probably many more than those 35,000 incidents that occur that are not reported. Um, part of the um, success that we believe we're going to see from both CDM and from um, uh, Einstein is more accuracy in what is actually occurring on uh, departments and agency networks. So I'm going to get our, uh, some audience participation too. All those numbers that, that Jason was talking about, how many of you think there's an appreciable difference between those kinds of numbers and the private sector from on a, on a uh, per capita basis? Who, who thinks there's a difference? Who doesn't think there's a difference? I'm here to tell you there isn't a difference. <laughs> there's no difference between the federal government and the private sector in terms of per capita incidents that occur. A again, it, it, it revolves around how do you define an incident? An incident in, in one case might be Oh, I lost my PIB card. Uh, and an incident in another case might be, holy crap, we got WannaCry all over the place. So, you know, depends. Uh, so it's important to keep things in, con in context when you're talking about incidents and, in and the way incidents occur. So one thing you don't know, remember in your head, context applies to incidents. Think through it before you jump off the ledge. Fair enough. Now, one thing about incidents that, we, that OMB changed the definition of what a, a, an incident is and why I report. And, and this is the second year OMB did that, so actually we, now we have an apples to apples comparison year That's over right. year. So John, just generally speaking, when, when you, the NKIC gets a call, or an, hopefully a call, not an email from an agency saying <laughs> they think they had an incident, walk me through maybe a little bit of, of what the NKIC does and, 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 and what, how, do you def, how do you ensure that they're calling a, an incident an incident? Yeah, so, so uh, that's a great question. Well, one of the things, keep in mind, uh, the, the, uh, all the discussion that we've had earlier today about developing relationships and trust. Uh, that's important because you don't succeed when they call in. Um, we have steps that we go through. There's a process, there's a, you know, a quick response card, everything we do. So an, an agency calls us and says, we have this going on. And we see, okay, um, how do you know? What tells you that this incident is happening? And what are the elements of this incident that you can at least see? Um, we will immediately um, give that to one of our incident response managers who's gonna start taking a look across our spectrum. What do, we, what do we know from a CDM reporting perspective? What do we know from an Einstein reporting perspective? What else do we know based upon the relationships we have with that particular agency? Try to help them understand what actually is going on. And also, we're gonna have another group uh, in the NKIC, I mean, the duty officers managing all this, but uh, there's another group in the NKIC that focuses primarily on Einstein, uh, and they're gonna be looking at um, uh, um, logs to see, okay, if you're, you're reporting it in this agency, is it happening anywhere else? 
so we get a bigger picture. Is this something that's affecting government-wide or is it something that's isolated in a particular agency? Um, and so we'll, we'll start that dialogue and then depending on what we find, we'll elevate to potentially a response. Um, if, if, if they think they need assistance, we offer that assistance. Uh, we gotta go through you know, uh, general counsel hoops uh, but in the federal government, the good thing on an incident response is they don't have to do any paperwork. It's already been done. All they got to do is have an email from the CIO that says activate the, the standing framework and off we go. So that's basically at a high level, Jason, how it happens. You are about to uh, you answer my question because I was going to say, didn't you have a memo that said you ha after the 2014 heart, was it heart bleed? Uh, I think so. That was 2014. Yeah, yeah that, that had that, that OMB yeah. finally was like, yeah, this is ridiculous. This is create these ahead of time. Uh, one last one real quick and then we'll want to move on to Martin. Um, you talk about the uh, response and whether it's government-wide. How often are they government-wide, generally speaking? I, I know each one's different, but if agency X calls you, how many times do you find it in Y, Z, A, B, C, D, go on? Uh, that's, I don't have a number right in front right. of me, but we see it every now and then where it's in a couple of places. Um, you know, WannaCry is a really good example to talk about because everybody knows what WannaCry was. And we saw that in a couple of different, um, both federal agencies, state agencies, and private sector entities. So, right. yeah. And WannaCry, if you're not familiar with it, the, the federal response was excellent. And, and uh, one of the things about it, maybe Jeanette Manfred, when she gets here, will maybe talk about this a little bit, is, is that's actually, you can tag back to the efforts back in 2015 and 2014 that led to this successful effort around WannaCry. Uh, so Martin Stanley is also at DHS. Uh, Martin, tell us a little bit about um, High value assets, but also uh, Martin's going to help us understand <coughs> what Ron Roth was maybe going to talk about. So maybe start there. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's too bad that Ron couldn't be here today. Raise your hand if you came here to see Ron, because I came here because Ron <laughs> asked me to come. Ron is absolutely a, dy a dynamic speaker. He's almost as good as you. <laughs> Thanks for that. We just want to wind <laughs> up, um, John, and let him go. So um, the I think we're, we're supposed to. Tell the audience something they don't know, so Hopefully. something you don't know. Something oh, I don't know a lot. So, so uh, actually, today is the public release of the draft of 8160 Volume Two, and those of you who are here may not have actually seen it yet or seen the announcement, and you probably didn't get a chance to read it because only a select few of us actually had a chance to look at this draft. And you know, I'm here uh, in representing the the DHS High Value Asset program, which is actually a federal government-wide program, which I think we're very familiar with. It's highly prominent in the IT modernization report, um, as well as now in the, the FISMA report. And I think some of the data that Jason was talking about is out of the, the most recent FISMA report, which was just released. So 80160, which is system security engineering, initially, uh, what, I think the initial volume one was released in uh, 2014, 2015, along those there's a line at the same time that we were standing up a systems engineering group at DHS, which is going to be focused on assisting agencies with their security engineering challenges. So Ron and I actually got into immediate communication about how we would take these principles and apply them. Our team was actually then um, converted towards working on these high value assets, which has become a priority. And I think if you get a chance, I would really encourage you to look at volume two because it focuses on designing and engineering resiliency into systems, which is so uh, uh, critically important and it's a different mindset. And, I, and, and I'll take you back to when I first came to work at DHS, the division that I work in is was the Federal Network Security Division. Well, we gave up on Federal Network Security and it's now the Federal Network Resilience uh, Division, which is, I think, an indication and certainly well represented in, um, in volume two of 800160, how we should be thinking about the systems and the environments they're gonna be operating in. They're gonna get compromised. They're gonna be um, working in degraded uh, conditions. And we, and we have to make sure that the systems are designed in such a way that uh, they, can, they, can, they can sustain and they can uh, continue to operate on these important missions. As we've gone about looking at high value assets, uh, we talked about some of the common deficiencies and, and things that we've identified. There's no news there, though, because it's the stuff that we already know about that we're already seeing that are deficiencies everywhere. To John's point, the, the attack surface has the same kinds of issues, really, whether we're talking about 
you know, federal agencies or you know, commercial or you know, what have you. So how do we take this knowledge and do something with it that is helpful? Well, well first and foremost, we were talking, I think the earlier panel was talking about identification of high value assets. It's turned out to be like one of the biggest challenges <coughs> is, is large organizations really understanding what their high value assets are. We were talking about, well, what's the list? Everyone would like to see the list. Well, the list in fact is changing and the list is temporal because it depends on what particular missions are interesting. In certain years, a certain mission may be more interesting than other ones, right? You know, we all, we all know about what's going on in, in the press about that. So um, the idea is to, to have a better, uh, a better handle on what the important systems are that we should be focused on securing, how we go about assessing them, and then how we go about building in these resiliency uh, um, means. So that's where we're working you know, closely with NIST and also with the agencies to assist them in that process. Um, identification of these systems, I'll underscore, we continually go out on assessment, and I'm sure it would be the exact same thing if we went out to commercial entities or, or whomever, and we're looking at a system and it's like, hmm, this doesn't seem like the right system that we should be looking at. Or, you know, you know how, how, how is this determination made that this was a critical system? So there's a lot of that that's ongoing. We've gotten much better at identifying what these systems are over the last couple of years, and now we're working um, closely with both the stakeholders, the folks that manage these systems, as well as our partners in the NKIC to develop the regiments to go in and rapidly assess these systems in a way that's helpful. We've taken all this information over the last three years. Um, we've assessed over 100 systems, and we've made these determinations about what the common findings are. We work closely with NIST, um, with Ron and his team, to produce and to release, it's actually on the Federal Network Resilience public facing website, um, something that's called the High Value Asset Control Overlay. It's an 853-based eight, um, control overlay, which details not only the controls, but the way the controls should be implemented in order to protect against the common deficiencies that we found. It's obviously not the, the ultimate solution to 100% you know, assurance, but it, it's something that's out there for agencies to use and we're working with them to apply this to particular <coughs> systems that can most benefit from it. So I hope that was some things that you didn't know, Jason. Uh, I learned, well, that's excellent. Now I have a follow-up though. Sure. So the, the control overlay, one of the big challenges when you look at the 853 is there's 120, a thousand controls uh, and it's the like IGs, yeah, it just feels that way. And the IGs tend to come in and say, the auditors come in and say, you didn't do control seven or 12 and 15 and 70 and 60 uh, minus one. How did you guys work on the, on the overlay for the HVAs? Did you guys work with the IG community to ensure that they're not gonna come in and, and kind of slap the risk of, uh, risk of, of some CIOs and CISOs for not every single one? So I think that's a separate problem. Right, you know, the, the, the way that the IGs and, and this, this, you know, one size fits all, and this would be a great question if Ron was here because he, he can talk endlessly and energetically about it, but the, the idea that, that one size fits all for these systems, that you take the, you know, low monitor or high baseline and you apply it and then you feel good and you walk away is not the way that we need to be thinking about doing this. And, and you know, certainly I think um, hasn't been, wasn't the, the intention of those, those baselines to begin with. It's understanding what the threats are. It's understanding what your critical capabilities are and, and, how, and how those are vulnerable to those threat actors and making sure that you're managing those risks in a, in a you know, timely manner along with how you're managing your overall mission because as I, when I ran the security program at, at the Food and Drug Administration, I used to say with some regularity, I can secure the email system 100%. If everyone wants 100% assurance on the email system, I'll just go down there and I'll turn it off, right? You know, we can't lose sight of the bigger picture that these systems are actually in place and being used for critical missions. So it's not just the application of those, those controls, but doing it in a way that's useful. And we felt that we did that with the overlay, which was to take a subset of controls, which is probably, I think it's somewhere between 70 and 80 controls, 
with a lot of specifics about how those controls should be implemented so that we don't leave gaps that um, we've found through these assessments. Excellent. Um, and I actually had an <coughs> interesting interview with the uh, Council for IG's subcommittee on IT recently about this, this issue about how to make sure the CIOs, CISOs, CI, um, OMB, and, and the IG community are on the same page. So I'll just uh, do shameless plug two there. Um, let me turn to David. David already told us great things. So David, I just one follow-up, and then we're going to go to audience questions. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about the UK model, and, and could that work in the US? But I won't because that, that's not your job. But uh, that's a great, it's a great example. But let's talk bug bounty because I think that's becoming a very popular approach. You talked about cost savings, and you talked about um, uh, the, the beneficiary of, of the benefits of the fact that adversaries now, you know, you're closing up gaps that maybe we wouldn't know about. <clears throat> is, is, is there a time when, when bug bounty is like, what's the next step? Where can we go? Okay, we've done bug bounties. We've done it twice. We've done it three times. Maybe you can do it 100 times. But, but is there a, the, the next, what's your, in three years, are we going to still do bug bounties or are we going to do something else? Right, right. And, and so I think my talk actually plays in well with what we're discussing here. I mean, for, again, I'm an operational guy, right? I see cyber threats every single day, and I'm here to underscore <coughs> that you really need those foundational best practices in place to really fend off the vast majority of the cyber threat activities that are out there. And, and bug bounties are, are just a great way, again, to secure <coughs> some of those foundational assets. I mean, we're talking about secure code in, right? We're talking about, you know, hardened websites. The adversary is, is gonna poke and prod and they only need to be right once, right? Whereas the defender, we need to be right every single time. And so I think bug bounties, there's a, there, there's a huge swath of uh, potential that's out there, right? You look at the DoD alone, and we have over 15,000 networks, right? Everywhere from office buildings in Washington, D.C. to battlefields in Afghanistan, right? So it's gonna, and these are continuously popping up, right? Coming down, new networks are joining. So I think there's always gonna be a role for a bug bounty type initiative, where I think you're gonna see it, 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 the, the question to your point is probably gonna be, you know, is there a more scalable approach? Can we bring in more machine learning, right? How do we kind of get that next iteration right. and, and I, I think we're all gonna be very interested in how that evolves just because again we're seeing great you know, both economic potential from bug bounties and eliminating that attack service for the adversary and so uh, yeah I, I bug bounties are absolutely I think a core part of what we should be doing going forward all right all right let's open up to the audience for questions somebody has a microphone out there usually I like to have it but they took it from me um, so come on really is this a shy audience or is this just we didn't give you anything you didn't know. They haven't had dessert yet. They haven't had dessert yet. <laughs> not, not enough sugar. Not enough sugar. All right. Mm -hmm. well, they'll have to put up a. Oh, there we go. Thank you, sir. Otherwise, I was going to start throwing down the, the, the hard balls <laughs> or the soft balls. Tell them who you are, please. Uh, uh, yeah, Andy Anderson from Cybersecurity Dispatch. Um, I also came to see Ron, so sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> But I actually, he's he was, delightful. Yeah, and he was nice enough to actually send me a copy of the, um, the release today. So I actually had uh, a chance to read it. And what was stunning for me is one, it was like, it was ideas that I've seen talked about so much, um, particularly around kind of dynamic um, positioning of networks, moving target defense, so many of these ideas. Um, unfortunately, in, in this room, maybe those ideas are well understood or talked about, but I go to lots of different events. And in the commercial world, those ideas are not, are not permeating um, across those. We're still thinking about static defenses. W what, what is it going to take for the rest of kind of the community to understand that besides coming to a Billington mm -hmm. conference? So shameless plug. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at the, at the, the question first. You know, I, I think a lot of it is going to be um, implemented by commercial providers of you know, the cloud-based services. And so I think it will probably be a differentiator for the cloud providers that are able to adapt these kinds of technologies and approaches into their services. Those will, you know, hopefully be the winners, you know, versus the ones that are just providing, you know, the, the, the more basic components. So, you know, I think that's, that's probably a path. It, if you go to someplace like RSA, which is, you know, just so striking to see Rooms and rooms and rooms, huge exhibit halls full of tools, right? That cybersecurity is not a tools problem. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an attitude problem. But what, what strikes me the most is you talk with folks that are like the cybersecurity person at their company, and some very large companies have only like one or two cybersecurity people. I'm fortunate to work with 
four or 500 really good cyber people. I don't know how someone in an individual company could manage to be an expert in all these areas and figure out which things to apply. It's got to be further back in the supply chain, right, where, where you know, it's built in and it's just a capability that they're going to you know, take advantage of along with anything else as, you know, as, as a differentiator in their selection. And, and John, let me hook on to his question because one of the things that DHS is doing is through AIS, auto automated information sharing, the, that initiative, and that is kind of trying to get what this gentleman's getting to is how do you push out or how do you include the private sector into this idea of, uh, hey, this is a threat, we have to all act together because if they break into DHS or, or Interior or Commerce or whoever may, may be able to beat off that threat, but they may have a back door through a contractor system, so if they're not paying attention, we're still all at risk, weakest chain, the weakest link in the chain. Uh, right. So talk a little bit about the AIS program, maybe about how that fits in, and then, I don't know, David, if you can add to it or not. Yeah, so, so um, automated indicator sharing is a, a program that, that uh, we run out of the NKIC, which is machine-to-machine -machine, uh, sharing of uh, indicators of compromise. Um, we are uh, getting ready to kick off um, the second version of that um, as STIX 2.0 rolls out. Uh, that is, we think it's going to be a significant improvement in the ability to, uh, um, to better understand when you receive an indicator what you should do with it. Uh, it'll have some provenance with the indicator. In other words, is it good? Is it a, is it bad or is it really bad? Uh, it'll have uh, a score associated with it that um, will tell you essentially is it a known source or an unknown source so that when you uh, receive an indicator, you can teach your decision engine the same way Martin was talking about. Your, your decision engine can then decide based upon your current risk profile what should we do with that indicator. Should we just ignore it because it doesn't really matter? Should we really um, take action on it? Uh, and then what action should we take? We think um, AIS in the first iteration was just to start the idea of getting people used to machines um, sharing information back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not to the point yet where the machines are actually taking action based upon that information that's being shared. And that's what we think 2.0 is gonna give us uh, is more people that are um, comfortable uh, building their decision engine to allow those actions to occur once an indicator uh, arrives. And to Dave's point in, in his earlier talk, that eliminates the human from that loop, except that the thought pro process part on the front end, and the human is, doesn't have to take action, now the machines can, and we can focus people with um, really giant brains and, and great wetware on things that humans need to be focused on. Right. Yeah. That, does that answer the question, Jason? Yeah, and you told me something I didn't know. <laughs> Scary, isn't it? Yeah, well, I don't know a lot. Yes. And J Jason, I'll also add, you know, you're talking to a lot of CISOs in industry, right, and they're really looking to, to automate the IOC sharing, right, whereas two, two years ago, it was all about getting the infrastructure and the plumbing, if you will, right. in place to be, to be able to re receive those machine-to-machine -machine learners. And, you know, that's one of the many reasons in which we have a DHS embed in our NSA Cybersecurity Operations Center is when th those requests come in, if it's an indicator of ours, we're right there. We can give that context and, and provenance that John talked about, you know, to, to the, the person who's asking. Because I think that's the next step, right? Automate the IOCs, but provide the defender context and understanding of why that action needs to be taken. Yep. Excellent. Now we have another question right here. Yeah, so Larry Hale, GSA. This is question probably a shameless plug for uh, for GSA, but uh, it's directed towards Martin and. Um, has to do with the uh, high value assets program. <clears throat> and um, I, I just want to make sure that uh, how can we do a better job of raising awareness in agencies that um, they don't have to wait for uh, DHS to come and do an HVA assessment in their agency that, uh, that, that in partnership with DHS, GSA has uh, over 100 companies on the highly adaptive cybersecurity special Accents, item numbers. Yep. What, what, what sin is that again? It's called the HACS SIN, Highly Adaptive <laughs> Cybersecurity SIN. Schedule 70, right? Schedule 70. All right, just want to make sure. I Thank you, yeah. Jason. Appreciate the plug. I'm, I'm into shameless plugs, you know, <laughs> federalnewsradio.com. Yeah. So, so, so this is great. It's a great question. Um, you, we've spoken with um, the, uh, the team over there, Bill Zelensky's team, right? They, they're, they're the ones that, uh, that, that are uh, running that. And what we're trying to do actually is to not only – I guess drum up business, right? You know, for 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 hacks ends, but also to um, evolve and adapt the services 
because at least from you know our perspective, the things that we provided over to them are now probably three years old, right? To to put on as services. So um, we've got some discussions going on, and OMB is certainly pushing it, and it's one of the deliverables in the IT modernization report. So we're tracking it at the uh, secretary level. <laughs> so yes, we are working what, what very are, closely with that team. One of the things I want to jump on about that, however, and I think it's really important for us to keep this in mind, and that is, um, and, and it's great that, that, the, that we're working with the private sector to, to create that capability to do those uh, HVA assessments. Um, the, the key thing, however, we need to keep in mind is there's gotta be some common ground in those assessments. You know, you could have one company out here that does it this way and another company over here that does it that way and the data will never be able to talk to each other. Um, and, and more importantly, there's got to be a quality measure in there that says, if I've hired this company to do that assessment, then they're going to damn well do it in a way that really does an assessment. It's not just a check in the box. Uh, to your point, to your point uh, those companies are evaluated to the standards that, uh, that were, have been given to us by NIST and approved by DHS. So um, they, they're not just signing up and getting on schedule. These are companies that actually go through a second set of evaluations to get on the four SINs for, yep. uh, for hacks. Yep. And it, it's in partnership with, uh, with uh, Martin's office so in terms of- and, But his point is, 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 is let's make sure that we keep those standards fresh because we know a lot more now than we did when we originally blessed off on those. And, and, not, and not only that, I think it's important to, to really foot stomp this. The high value asset program was put in place so that at the federal level, we would understand the systemic risk <coughs> posed by these systems that are being operated at an agency level. And what we don't want to do is have all this risk management done, you know, in a compartment someplace where that, the results of that information are not feeding back to our perspective for systemic risk at the federal enterprise level because we've got to understand and the things that we are seeing are interconnections or interdependencies between these systems that we didn't understand before which have a mission impact. So I, I, know, I know that we're out of time, but um, I think that that's very important as part of this that we don't want to drive this, you know, under cover of the night where we don't see um, what's going on with these assessments because we, we've got to have that, that view so that we can make the right kinds of decisions and set the right policies for managing systemic risk uh, posed by these systems. Yeah, the best, um, the best way to in, in encourage uh, corrective behavior is to be as transparent as possible on, on those things. So it, it, it feeds itself. And, and in fact, at the, there was a hearing on CDM yesterday and one of the things that Kevin Cox, their colleague who runs the CDM program talked about was I think a quarter of all federal assets now report into the CDM dashboard, the government-wide dashboard. And, and if you're not familiar with the CDM program, John or Martin can tell you much better than I can, but generally speaking, it's, it's collecting cybersecurity information from a bunch of other agencies and, and, and bringing them up to the government-wide level so DHS can see what's happening government-wide. I think you said by the end of April, 90% uh, of all assets or something to that effect will be going through the government-wide uh, dashboard. It's a, and that's what you're talking about, I, I think, in the end is, is getting the, the broader perspective. I realize that, 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 Jason, that's only just the start. Yes. Right, that's the beginning, the four, first four elements of CDM, uh, what, what he's been There's talking about. There's two more phases, yes. That's right. All right, Tom, am I getting the hook? I, I'm, I'm gotten the hook. So let's, uh, first of all, thank you very much for participating. Let's give the panel a round of applause. And uh, I will exit stage right.